Well, good morning, New Mammoth family. It's been a while. Uh, well, I just first, I want to thank you so much, those of you uh, who have prayed for me. I've, uh, some of you know, had this condition with uh, my eyes, and uh, it's, uh, I'm still on the mend, but uh, as I pray, God enabled me to finish studying this week and being able to preach, and so, right, the Lord gives us what we need, and so I'm so thankful for that, and I'm so thankful for you, and so thank you so much for your, your constant care and your constant prayers. Um, what I'd like you to do is, if you have a Bible, open it up to Genesis chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, we encourage you to download our NMBC app. There's a free ESV Bible in there. And uh, this morning, we're going to start at the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And uh, we are going to cover quite a lot of ground together. Uh, we're going to go do an overview of Genesis chapter 1 all the way to chapter 11 which is known, it's the first section of the, of the book of Genesis, which is known as primeval history. And as I was putting this sermon together this Thursday and working through it all and just so much ground to cover, and I, I just thought to myself, why did I do this to myself? This is just so much. Um, but, but no, this, it's going to function as, uh, as an overview. And so oh, I just want to apologize if it feels like you're drinking from a fire hose because there's so much coming at you. Um, but, but this f message is to function like an introduction to a book as well as providing several jumping off points and, and just providing important context for our study on the life of Abraham, which we're going to be studying uh, pretty much through the holidays. So I'm really excited about this, this study, and uh, I really want to encourage you. I hope that this sermon also functions as a, a motivator to, to go home and read through Genesis chapters 1 through 11 this week. And so we have a lot to cover, so let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your amazing grace for your steadfast faithfulness, for your perfect love that is so evident here and modeled in the book of Genesis. And so, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would renew hearts and minds this morning, that you would continue to mold us into the shape of, of your image, that we would accurately reflect who you are as your people, and that we would never, ever forget what a privilege it is to study your word, to be known by you, that right now we are communing with the one true God of the universe, and you are speaking to us through your word. And so, Lord, may we receive it together this morning with, with glad hearts, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of the greatest joys... I get to experience as a pastor is time and again having a front row seat for when the Holy Spirit of God takes hold of someone's life and begins to transform them from the inside out. And what you have to understand is that when someone goes from being spiritually dead in their sins to now being made alive in Christ, that the Spirit of God takes residence within them, that the Holy Spirit makes His home in them, that dwells within them now, that we, we have to understand that there's, there's drastic changes that begin to take place in their life. We would hope so, right? Going from being dead to being alive. And one of those changes is that the Spirit of God desires to be fed with the Word of God. And so regardless of someone's intellectual background or education level, you will begin to see them develop a supernatural, voracious appetite for the Word of God. People who never were readers before suddenly can't take their nose out of the Bible because God has compelled them to saturate themselves in His living Word. They can't get enough of learning more about who God is, His holy character, and discovering how they're able to grow closer to Him. And so naturally, as a, as a pastor, one of the questions that people will ask me as, as they come to Christ and they want to begin reading the Bible is, you know, which book of the Bible should I start with? 
And the most common recommendation you'll find is usually to start in the New Testament with the book of John because it's written with the specific intent and purpose that by reading it, it actually says this in the book of John. It's very straightforward. It says that by reading it, you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. We're actually reading the, the gospel of John together right now as a family before the kids go to school in our family devotions. Now, other people will say maybe the gospel of Mark because it's the most concise and action-packed gospel. And that's actually what the, the youth group is doing together this fall. And, and for those who want to dive headfirst into theology, some may suggest uh, the book of Ephesians, which we covered together last fall. Or if you really want to dive into the deep end, go, go after Romans. I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's heavy lifting. But of course, there's no right or wrong answer to that question. And when you get down to it, what is most important is not where you start, but that you do start. However, when it comes to approaching the Old Testament, there's little debate that the place to start reading is the book of Genesis. And I might, you know, go out there and say that, that Genesis isn't a bad place to start reading the Bible altogether. But in my humble opinion, if Genesis isn't the first book of the Bible you read, then it has to be the second. Maybe, maybe it's like a good prelude. You know, you read one of the Gospels, and, and you read about Jesus and, 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 this, and then the message of salvation, and then, then, then you go back to Genesis. You know, it's kind of like how Star Wars starts with 4, 5, and 6, and then it goes back to 1. You know, the same thing with the Lord of the Rings, and you got the Hobbit, and then you got this other thing that's going on right now. Maybe, maybe that's the best way to go about it. I, I don't know. But, but the book of Genesis it, it, it is just so packed. It is so good. And, and the first 11 chapters of Genesis, they serve as the backdrop of the entire biblical narrative of redemption, detailing who God is, how everything came to be, God's holy character, humanity's origin and purpose, how sin entered the world, sin's devastating consequences, why things are the way they are today, and how God in his amazing grace, perfect love, and steadfast faithfulness has put a plan into place in order to rescue, redeem, and restore his creation unto himself. And so this morning, we're going to look at Genesis chapters 1 through 11 together through a wide lens in order to help us establish the proper context and foundation for our fall sermon series, The Journey of Faith, The Account of Abraham in the book of Genesis. And so our outline for this morning's passage is in three parts, and it's creation, fall, and redemption. And so number one, creation, what we find in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 is the account of how God created all things. God's design was for all things to be good in every way, that there'd be no pain or suffering, and for humanity to live with him in a perfect, harmonious relationship forever. It is the account of how things were meant to be. Number two, fall. Next, in Genesis chapter 3, is the account of how sin entered the world, which marred and distorted God's creation, resulting in pervasive evil, brokenness, pain, and death, creating separation between us and our holy God. This is the account of how things came to be, how they presently are. And then lastly, number three, redemption, that despite humanity's disobedience, rebellion, and betrayal, God does not abandon us in our sin, but instead makes a promise to redeem his creation, which is carried out through a family. And this family becomes a great nation in which the salvific, steadfast promises of God are both made and kept. The, the journey of this family of faith begins with its father, Abraham, and its fulfillment is found in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the Savior of the world. And so this is the account of the eternal weight of glory, our future salvation that has been made secure in Christ Jesus. And so this is where we're headed, not only this morning, but throughout the fall as we study the account of Abraham together. And so let's begin. I'm going to read Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, then I'm going to skip down to the end of the chapter and read verse 31. So it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. 
And then God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So I skipped over a lot there, okay? He, he, he creates the entire universe in between verse 31, right, and verse, and verse 2. Um, but again, I, I just want to, I can't encourage you enough to go home and, and read Genesis chapter 1 through 11 in full on your own. You know, one of my kids has a real interest in, you know, the animal kingdom, zoology. And so being that I'm his father, I wanted to encourage him in it and, and point him in the right direction. So I began to tell him about this, this, this show, this program that brought me a lot of joy over the years and has taught me so much about animals. That until watching this program, you know, I never realized this. I don't, maybe you know this. Rabbits are the most clever, smooth, and confident animals in the entire animal kingdom. It also taught me that ducks are a bit ill-tempered and full of rage. Pigs often have a stutter. Mice are the fastest of all animals. Skunks are the most romantic. And coyotes are the most persistent and have just incredible resolve. You would never watch Looney Tunes to learn about the animal kingdom. Why? Because that's not its purpose. That, that's not its design. Because every piece of, of art or, or literature or film, whatever, whatever you want to call it, it's created to fall within a certain genre and has a specific purpose. Like Looney Tunes, its genre is what? It's comedy. Okay? And the same is true about the Bible. That the Bible is this supernatural book put together, 66 different books put together, written across thousands of years with so many different authors on different continents, and, and there's so many different genres within the Bible, right? Whether it be narrative, apocalyptic literature, you know, wisdom literature, poetry, and on and on and on we can go. And, and when it comes to Genesis, and the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, many people make the mistake of treating it as if it were a science textbook. And while this isn't to say that the creation account doesn't have anything to contribute to scientific theories, please make sure you heard me there, okay? Save your rotten tomatoes and your, your angry emails at me, okay? Not saying that it doesn't have anything to contribute. But the book of Genesis was not written in order to settle every modern scientific debate. And if you read it that way, you miss its true meaning. And sadly, many Christians have allowed contemporary questions directed towards the book of, of Genesis, such as young earth, old earth controversy, and micro-macro evolution, and adaptation, and every, even the, the origin of dinosaurs to cause tremendous division and chasms within the people of God. And I'm not saying not to have those discussions or those things don't matter, but they shouldn't be things that separate us or distract us from what God is trying to say to us and what he's calling us to. And so what we must recognize is that if we approach the book of Genesis in this way, we're depriving ourselves of receiving and understanding the central meaning of what God is trying to communicate us through the, the biblical writers under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that the purpose of the book of Genesis is to reveal to us the identity and character of our God through the account of how all things were created by him, through him, and for him, unto his glory, according to his perfect design in revealing his perfect purposes. The primary meaning of the book of Genesis is not centered around resolving modern day scientific controversies, but rather it was written to provide us with the foundational truths about God and ourselves and the world. Now looking, in looking at the creation account, we learn so much about who our God is. We learn that God is the Alpha and the Omega and that he has no beginning or end in which the psalmist proclaims in Psalm 90 verse 2, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That creation points to God's holiness, that he is set apart and perfect and there is no one like him. He's also all-knowing and all-powerful and ever-present, able to create everything out of nothing. That when you read the, the creation account in Genesis, that, that God speaks everything into existence. How majestic is our God? That compared to the other false gods of the ancient Near East who were petty and cruel and self-serving, mischievous and brutal, 
That God uses his sovereignty, power, and creativity within creation to create beauty and blessing to be enjoyed by all. See, creation serves as a means to reflect God's righteous and holy character. And if we go to Psalm 8, it says, creation declares the glory of God. However, despite all of that, nothing in all of creation reflects who God is, God's being, more than humanity. And we read in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. See, as, a, as magnificent of, uh, uh, as God's creation of the, the earth and the sun and the moon and the stars and the sky and the oceans and the plants and the planets and the animals, as, as magnificent as, as all that is, its purpose is to serve as the backdrop for the main event, the creation of humanity. That Genesis makes it very clear that humanity has a very special place in God's creation that other creatures do not share. As they're specified as both male and female. And being created in the image of God. You see, while animals are capable of being glory bearers, only humans are image bearers. That mankind is set apart in the creation that when God created humanity, he breathes his very breath into us. Old Testament Bible scholar Tremper Longman writes, the Hebrew word for image can also be used for the construction of royal images. That is, while the king could not be physically present throughout his entire realm, he would set up images of himself throughout the kingdom to remind people of his authority. In this sense, the image of God may be taken to mean that human beings are God's representations in the creation. So being created in the image of God, we are the Lord's physical representations on this earth. We represent God. We were created to reflect his glory and advance his kingdom. And so when God tells Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, it's a command to reproduce his glorious image and goodness throughout the earth. That humanity was created to be God's masterpiece, reflecting his divine glory throughout the world, a declaration of his character and care and love and righteous rule over the rest of creation. That's why life, human life, is so sacred and precious. And so if that's the case, that God created everything to be good, and humanity in his image to be very good, then the question is, how do we explain the mess that is the world today? Obviously, something between then and now must have gone horribly wrong. And, and I don't know if there's any book that's ever been written where there's a, a bigger change in what happens between Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3. And so that brings us to the second point in our study this morning, fall. That in Genesis 3, we see the account of how sin entered the world which mars, distorts, and perverts all that God created to be good resulting in brokenness, evil, pain, and death thereby creating separation between us and our holy God. This is the account of how things came to be, how they presently are. So let's read Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7 together. Now the serpent, that's Satan, was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. 
But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. You know, as a parent, one of the things that turns me inside out, and, and I think you can relate, parents, is when my kids think they know better than me. Don't you just love that? Where it's just like, you're 10 years old, like, and you really think, like, you, you, you know better than me on this? It's, it's like they're functionally questioning if what I say is trustworthy or not. You know, they give you that look and they're like, I don't know if I can trust you on this or not. As if I've led them purposely down the wrong path before. As if I'm trying to deceive and to fool them. Because you'd think that it'd be so obvious to every child that since their parents brought them into this world, clothed them, fed them, housed them, cared for them, and showered them with amazing blessings, whether it be vacations and Christmas gifts or birthday parties, that, 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 that how is it possible that when it comes to such benign things, that when we tell our kids something like to wear sunscreen at the beach, or bring a sweatshirt to an evening baseball practice, or, or to go to the bathroom before a long car ride, that they question us as if we're trying to, to pull one over on them. Like, I don't know. I don't know about this. I think I know better than you. That despite our impressive resume of providing and sustaining and caring for their every need and every aspect of their life, they've decided to look inward and go their own way by wearing no sunscreen at Sandy Hook on a 90 degree, degree day in July. So I'm, I'm going I'm to go on my own way on this and see how it, it works out. And of course, not to pick on our own kids, we did the same exact thing to our parents. Here's my point. At the heart of the fall was humanity succumbing to the deception that despite God's perfect love, steadfast faithfulness, and providing for their every need, Adam and Eve believed the lie that God did not have their best interest at heart, that he's untrustworthy, and that they'd be better off on their own. Martin Lloyd-Jones writes, Adam and Eve accepted the suggestion that God was against them, and they tried to assert themselves and make themselves equal with God, and thereby they fell. And all the troubles in the history of the world to this present day are the result of that one act. The world is as it is because of sin, because men and women have become alienated from God, because they have been trying to live independent lives. That act of rebellion produced immediate chaos, and the chaos has continued. Eating of the tree is humanity's declaration of independence from God. Eating of the tree is humanity's declaration of moral autonomy. Okay, stay with me on this. Moral autonomy is the functional belief and assertion that our way is better than God's way. That our laws are better than God's laws. That our definition of right and wrong supersedes his definition of right and wrong. And that we would all be better off if we were God and ruled in his place. And that is the, the ethos or the philosophy that rules over our world today. It's sin. And we've all seen how that's worked out. This desire for moral autonomy stems from Adam and Eve's choice to follow the serpent, to follow Satan and his agenda, which is to undermine the authority of God. That the goal of the serpent is to undermine God's authority, destroy God's creation and kingdom, and establish a shadow kingdom for himself where he rules and reigns in darkness. 
And what we must understand is that Satan is a jealous, evil, and miserable being who is envious of God's ability to create. That only God can create. Satan can't. And he's really mad and he's really bitter about that. That only God can create. And so Satan being a resentful, rip-off artist and con man tries to destroy God's creation. And make a lesser version of it in his attempt to undermine God's authority. And there are just endless examples we can point to throughout history or in our world today of this. Whether it be where God is creator, Satan introduces macroevolution. God creates humanity as male and female. Satan speaks lies and confusion where Facebook now has 58 different genders for everyone to choose from. God blesses us with the gift of marriage. Satan seeks destruction through divorce and sexual promiscuity. God blesses us with, with government to serve his purposes while Satan introduces corruption. God creates diversity of cultures and different nations. Satan seeks to pervert it with racism and oppression. Again, we can go on and on with the examples, but at the end of the day, the reality is, is that Satan is a counterfeit ruler who has created a world system that leads to brokenness, suffering, and death, while our God is the one true king of the universe and creator who invites us to live under his authority in his righteous eternal kingdom so we can know eternal life and receive his blessings. Humanity continues to fall for the deception of the serpent by allowing sin to rule over them in their pursuit of moral autonomy for the duration of primeval history which runs through Genesis chapter 11. And if you read through Genesis chapter 4 through 11, we see that the more humanity tries to live apart from God and go at it on their own, the more society spirals downward. Murder. Sexual immorality and encompassing evil are addressed in the accounts of Cain and Abel, the perversion of the sons of God, and the events leading to the flood. However, the very pinnacle of moral autonomy can be found as primeval history comes to a close in chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel. That humanity becomes so prideful that they attempt to build a, a, a ziggurat, which is like a stepped pyramid, okay? that reaches the heavens in order to overthrow God and establish their own kingdom apart from him. That they want to make a great name for themselves. That they want to exalt their name over God's name. That it's all about them and their glory. So the consequence of the fall is that Adam and Eve's sin is passed down from generation to generation to generation to, to our generation where the perversion and the evil grows worse and worse and worse. And by eating the fruit, humanity has committed cosmic treason and rebellion against God that they've attempted to steal his glory, they've attempted to overthrow him. And in doing so, they've defamed his name, image, and holy character. Remember that? What were we created for? What's our purpose? To reflect who God is. Yet in our sin, you look at humanity and it's like, that's what God's like? No, thank you. And so, so it's the, the greatest case of defamation we've ever seen. And worst of all, our sin has created a barrier between us and God. Where we see as humanity now must exit the garden as their actions have, have made them enemies of God and subject to his wrath. And so where it was God's intent and desire for humanity to share and to spread and enjoy his goodness and blessing to every corner of his creation and revealing his perfect love and kindness and, and generosity and, holy, and his holy character, humanity does the exact opposite in our sin. That instead of spreading God's blessing, love, and glory in our sin, we, we spread pain and destruction and death. And again, while doing so, we defame God's holy name. So the question we're posed with is this. Where does God and his creation go from here? Is this a hopeless situation? How can such devastation and evil ever be overcome? And this brings us to our third and final point in our study together this morning, redemption. Redemption. That despite humanity's disobedience, rebellion, and betrayal, God does not abandon us in our sin. But instead, it's an opportunity to show how great our God is. That in his amazing grace, 
and steadfast faithfulness, the Lord makes a way for his creation to be redeemed and to return into his presence. It becomes an opportunity to once again reveal his supreme power, his holiness, his perfect love as he did in creation, which he would do through his son, Jesus, and through the spirit indwelt people of God. This is the account of the hope of glory, the story of redemption that ends with the people of God's salvation. And so let's go ahead and move forward and read Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 together. It says, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, I know I've been heavy on the parroting illustrations this morning, but I got one more for you. It's never fun to discipline your children or have to be disciplined as a child. Am I right? There are times when emotions run high. We often regret some of the things we say in the heat of the moment, which most likely will require a future apology. And sometimes things just don't go as well as we hoped. But at the end of the day, what we need to realize is that the motivation for healthy discipline, healthy discipline, it comes out of love. And the goal is restoration. That Proverbs 3.12 says, For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, just as a father disciplines the son in whom he delights. So we almost always don't in, enjoy experiencing discipline. But as we get older, we realize that if it wasn't for that loving discipline in our lives, we would have spiraled out of control into oblivion. And so we're so thankful for it. And what we come to realize is that loving and just discipline, it results in our salvation. It does. And in the midst of addressing the sin of Adam and Eve and the serpent, the Lord plants his seed of redemption in Genesis chapter 3, 15. That even though humanity deserves death for its sin and rebellion against God, the Lord in his amazing grace and perfect love and steadfast faithfulness, he paves the way for us to be redeemed. Because in, in being consistent with his character, the Lord provides just and appropriate punishment to each of the three guilty parties after the fall in Genesis chapter 3. But he, but he extends his grace at the same time he's practicing this restorative discipline in the lives of his children, Adam and Eve. See, the Lord allows Adam and Eve to pursue repentance. However, with the serpent, he does not. For the serpent's deception and attack on his children, the Lord has both declared war on Satan while simultaneously sentencing him to live on death row. That for all of Satan's existence, he will have to live with the reality that no matter what he does, that no matter how hard he tries, he will fail. That's what Genesis 3.15 means. Genesis 3.15 is known as the Proto-Evangelium. Big theological word here, okay? Don't, don't get scared at it. Here's what it is. It is the first announcement of future salvation. It is the first gospel. Here's what it says. God will win and the serpent will lose. That's it. Genesis 3.15 onward. We get to see how God's going to do it. How's he going to do it? We know the end of the story, how this is going to play out, Genesis 3.15. I don't know how exactly it's going to play out, but we know the serpent is going to lose. God's going to win. God's providing a way back. That sin and death will be destroyed and humanity will be fully redeemed and restored. You see, Genesis 3.15 points forward to the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. That in Jesus' crucifixion, the serpent strikes the foot of the seed of the woman, but by dying and being raised again to life, he crushes the serpent's head. This time, humanity will not have to face the serpent on their own. But we will be one with Christ. We will be in Christ. We will be covered. The righteousness of Christ. We will be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Fully dependent upon God. And this is why Jesus can say in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That if you are a part of the people of God, you have a guarantee that God has done this work. And we are just waiting to, to see the fulfillment of it. It's the already but not yet. 
See, Genesis 1 through 11 is the account of what happens when humanity divorces itself from God. That apart from God, human beings are helpless in their sin, steadfastly pursuing moral decay. However, as primeval history comes to a close, the Lord announces that he is beginning something new, where a different path will be made available to him. And there's, there's, this, there's this genealogy at the end of Genesis chapter 11. A lot of times... We're guilty of, like, I, I don't know, genealogy. I'm just going to skip over this. But it's a really big deal. And it points to this guy, Abram. And Abram's name will eventually be changed into Abraham. And it's through Abraham where this different path will be made available. It's the path of faith. The journey of faith that we read in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And in him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Go, Abraham. Go, Abram. I got you. Trust me. Have faith in me. I will lead you to salvation. See, God's plan of redemption, it begins with a family. That's why we care so much about families here at NNBC. That's why it's one of our core values that you hear us talking about families so much. Because families are the vehicle of which God brings salvation. That God, he begins with this family. And then this family develops into a nation, a new nation unto himself. It's a separate people who will advance his redemptive plan and purposes. It would be through a na this man named Abram, who was a pagan moon worshiper, whose name would eventually be changed by God to Abraham, meaning the father of many nations, that all the families, all the people of the earth would be blessed through him, that through Abraham, God would do the seemingly impossible. He would bring salvation to the entire world. That Martin Lloyd-Jones writes, the story of Abraham is absolutely pivotal in any understanding of the whole message of the Bible. That once man sinned, he put himself under the power and influence and dominion of the devil, who since then has been co the controlling force in the life of this world. But now God has provided this other seed, this other people. So we are all, are, we're all aware of the state of this world. We're constantly reminded of how bad things are. But are we aware of the other possibility? See, the fact is, through Abraham, God is announcing another type of life. That God is calling us out of this dark and depraved kingdom. He's saying there's another way for you. Another type of life. A life in communion with God under his blessing that's marked by faith. We see that when we're left to our desires, that the desires of our heart, it results in anxiety and chaos and pain and death. Right? That's one of the things in our world is just follow your heart. Don't follow your heart. When has that ever, ever worked for you? God has provided us with another way. Follow him. It's the way of faith. And that's the central message of the account of Abraham. And the life of faith begins with us coming to the realization that we are completely helpless, powerless, and lost apart from God. That the life of faith is marked by humility and surrender and trust and our dependence upon God to meet our every need. This life of faith was perfectly modeled by the seed of salvation who would come through the line of Abraham, our Messiah, Jesus Christ. And you see, Jesus Christ is the definition of faith. He faithfully left heaven in obedience to his Father where he lived amongst his creation and he pursued us in love while we were still unlovable in our sin. That Jesus lived the perfect life that we could never live and died the death that we deserved in submission to his Father. That the cross of Jesus Christ, it declares his faithfulness to God unto death. That it is through his death that our sins are atoned for. That we're forgiven of our sins through his shed blood. And it's through his resurrection power that we can be made a new creation in Christ, fully restored unto God, thereby inheriting the promise of eternal life. This is the good news of the gospel. See, the good news of the gospel is that the Lord invites us to turn away from our sin, to turn away from our moral autonomy, to turn away from our rebellion, 
that we could be reunited with him forever, that there is another way, and this way is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And so if you find yourself lost this morning or on the wrong path, or maybe you walked into this building today just, just totally overwhelmed by your circumstances and situation in life, Jesus Christ is inviting you to choose a different path. It's the path of faith. It's the path of full surrender and trusting in God. As the Lord says to each of us this morning, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I'd like to call the worship team to come up. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for loving us while we were unlovable. We thank you for being faithful when we were unfaithful. We thank you that in our sin, you came and you pursued us and you provided the way of salvation, the way of faith, that you offer us this way out of this darkness that we are mired in, that, that just surrounds us and saturates our world today. We thank you for the hope that you've given us in Jesus Christ. And so I pray for anybody here this morning who has walked into this building feeling overwhelmed, feeling down, feeling consumed by darkness, like there's, there's no way out, that they would know the truth, that there is a way out, that you are the light shining in the darkness, that you have paved the path, you have made the way to salvation, that there is nothing you cannot do. Lord, I pray that you would soften hearts, and even for that one person, Lord, that they would reach out to you this morning and that they would trust in you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And they would take that step of faith and trusting in you, Lord Jesus, by grace through faith in you alone for salvation. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.